The Night Beat starts right now. I think perpetually there's never going to be enough of some people in some areas. Local hospitals taking in COVID-19 patients while having to send some of their own staff home. The struggle on the COVID front lines and how one local hospital is hoping to boost their staffing numbers. Also inmate on inmate murder in the Bear County Jail. This is the first time that it's happened. So what went wrong? You're going to hear from the sheriff coming up. Plus, San Antonio expecting a swift drop in temperatures later this week. We're going to check in with meteorologist Adam Kasky in a moment. But first, investigators looking for answers at the Bear County Jail tonight after two inmates were able to leave their cell and attack another inmate, killing him. Yeah, by the defender's count, this is at least the third inmate on inmate murder case since May of 2019. So we were asking, how could this happen? I've said it before that, that we are seeing a more violent type of inmate in this jail. Security at the Bear County Jail continues to be top of mind, especially after hearing two inmates broke out of their cell and attacked another inmate. You know, there's a term for it. We call it, we call it popping the cell. You can actually Google how to defeat the lock on a jail door and there's YouTube videos. Sheriff Javier Salazar says that's how 50-year-old Ernesto Tavera and 28-year-old Brandon Lerma got to this man Sunday morning. Vincent Garcia told a deputy he didn't feel comfortable with his cellmates before he was stabbed and killed. These three, un unfortunately, the victim and the two suspects are all documented members of the Texas Mexican Mafia. Salazar says gang members are grouped together to avoid spreading troublesome behavior. More violent inmates are also classified by what they wear. Whereas our regular inmates wear orange, these will all wear red. Tonight, Tavera and Lerma are being housed in a more secure part of the jail. As for changes to the other jail doors? We'd love to be able to say, well, we'll just throw an extra lock on every door in the building. But that's millions of dollars that, that I, just, I just don't know that we've got in the county budget. Now, during that attack, a deputy got to an area called the picket. We know that a cadet was standing guard. Both are safe and on administrative leave as part of a pr protocol here. Meantime, the Texas Rangers are investigating this. The future of the San Antonio Police Department still up for discussion, or at least part of it. Discipline and wages are the main subject of conversation in this union negotiation. Next week will mark one month since talks over the contract between the city and the police union began. The old contract expired back in September, but an evergreen clause keeps its terms in place. Both the city and the union have tentatively agreed to limit an arbitrator's power to reinstate a fired officer. But both sides still need to figure out how long the police chief has to actually discipline an officer. And the union is proposing a boost in pay. They want an increase of more than 17% over four years. We'll continue to follow this discussion as it happens. Now to the pandemic, another 4,300 new COVID-19 cases were confirmed today. Two more people have died from the virus. There's a little bit of a decline in hospitalizations, but we still have a long way to go. On the 1st of January, more than 400 COVID patients were in the hospital. And tonight, yeah, that's where we're at, we're at right now in the red. 1,196 people are in the hospital with covid 293 are in the ICU and 135 are on ventilators. The Omicron variant is known to spread quickly. The problem is it's also spreading among healthcare workers as they try and care for those who are hospitalized. The night team's Lee Waldman checked in with several of our area healthcare systems to see how they're keeping up with demand. We're doing it one more time. Um, Staff is tired. Exhaustion, emotional and physical, setting in for healthcare workers. An effect from the pandemic oftentimes hidden from the patients they serve. They'll never realize the amount of, of emotion that a caregiver, a nurse, an RT um, puts into their patient. The virus is also forcing staff to stay home if they're infected. Connie Thigpen says Baptist Medical Center is short staff when it comes to their permanent staff. They're relying on outside help. We have supplemental staff in the way of travelers. We also have some state nurses that are, are helping us out as well. Right now, Baptist Health Systems has more than 60 state staff nurses and more than 100 travel nurses. The story is the same at University Health System. There are 41 nurses and respiratory therapists helping from the state. The state is also helping Methodist Healthcare. They had 125 nurses and 15 respiratory therapists this month. 
it's just essential that we continue to try to bring new people on board because honestly, no one really knows when all this is truly going to end. It's why University Hospital budgeted increases for base salaries this year and is allowing for more flexible time off policies. Baptist Health is offering a $15,000 sign on bonus for qualified respiratory therapists and 20,000 for registered nurses. Both have skills and have knowledge that are keenly um, necessary during um, the continued battle with this pandemic. Tomorrow, Baptist Health is holding a virtual hiring event for a variety of positions, but particularly registered nurses and respiratory therapists. That's happening from 10 in the morning until 1 in the afternoon. If you head over to our website, ksat.com, and click on this story, we have links for you to register and to participate. Live outside the Medical Center, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Lee. The government's rollout of free N95 masks supposed to help limit the spread of the coronavirus. As some pharmacies in San Antonio received their shipment of free masks. It's also left some wondering, what is the difference between an N95 mask and a KN95 mask? University Health offers this answer. An N95 is a name that's given to a respirator, which is a special type of mask that provides more filtration than other non-respirator type of masks. And KN95s are more equivalent really to surgical or barrier masks. So they're very similar in name, but they have more filtration similar to barrier masks. They don't have quite the same level of rigor and filtration as the N95 respirators. And many continue to ask whether the N95 mask and the KN95 mask can be, more, more, can be worn more than once. Well, experts say yes, they can. You can reuse them if you take some precautions or break it all down on ksat.com. All you have to do is click on this article. And now for a look at some of the other big headlines tonight. In a few hours, Russia and the U.S. will have a phone call to discuss the tensions on Ukraine's border. Some Russian forces pulled back from that border, but now more Russian troops and equipment appear to be moving in. The Kremlin says it has no plans to invade. The U.S. is ordering the families of American diplomats to leave the U.S. Embassy there in that region. U.S. troops remain on alert for any possible deployment. Now here at home, one man already faced 13 traffic violations and a suspended license. And now Caesar George is taking a plea deal in a deadly crash that prosecutors say he caused. I wasn't intentionally that morning speeding. I was trying to get back to my wife who was pregnant, high risk. You know, I'm asking it in your heart to see that you have it in your heart to help a man who, who knows that the system isn't for anybody. A judge took George's history into account and sentenced him to eight years in prison per the plea agreement. That crash happened near Kitty Hawk Road and Tupperwine Road in March of 2020. George crashed into 79-year-old Eugene Roller, who was driving to get breakfast for himself and his wife, and Roller died in that crash. Also, Northside ISD is hoping that voters are going to approve a $992 million dollar bond. That money meant to help with renovations, roofing, technology, and security. The superintendent says that it can all be done without a tax rate hike. The proposal is going to appear on the May ballot. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. And here tonight, the Alamo City will hold the newest logistics warehouse for the Texas Department of Emergency Management. It is the first of eight planned facilities to open. It's meant to be a space to keep things like PPE, testing materials, other vital supplies for the state's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as other disasters. Last little bit of showers just hanging on in some locations far east of San Antonio. We're talking eastern Lavaca County and just about to move out of the KSAT 12 viewing area. Some impressive accumulations out here. Heard from Marty Bluta in Howitzville earlier today. He was nearing four inches in his rain gauge. And you look at the Doppler radar estimates and you see the heaviest and highest amounts farther east of town. I mean, we're talking one to three and almost four inches in parts of Lavaca County. Lesser amounts westward, officially at the airport in town, 1200 of an inch of rain. Hey, at least some folks got some decent rainfall. A couple of mild days, then get ready for the strong cold front to hit Wednesday night. We're going to talk more about that with temperatures and what it means for the chance of wintry precipitation in just a bit. Steph. All right, thanks, Adam. Still ahead on the night beat. It is all about gaining access to better pay. Who doesn't want that, right? One study suggests that it could start when your children are young. We're going to talk about the programs that parents may want to consider coming up.
And we go behind the kitchen door of this Indian restaurant on the northwest side. The owner tells us there's a reason for their low score behind the kitchen door. It's next on the Night Beat. All right, let's go behind the kitchen door tonight. Health inspectors visited Spice Fine Indian Cuisine for an inspection that uncovered some issues. The owner tonight giving us a response. This is the location near Loop 410 in Fredericksburg. Metro Health cited them for dishes stored in a mop sink, uncovered food in a walk-in cooler, and some cleanliness under equipment that needed to be fixed. They passed with a score of 78, but the owner says they know they need to do better and they're in that process. He blames staffing issues for the low score, saying there isn't enough people to help. Last uh, three, four months, I had like, you know, 10 people and, you know, they, they came like, you know, one week and they left one week. They left. So we are trying our best to do, but uh, placing ads to hiring. But, you know, still we are struggling to find like, you know, suitable persons. So many restaurants need help right now. By the way, the owner says he has nothing to hide. He went on to say they corrected several issues since the last inspection, and they're in the process of actually opening a new restaurant in the Stone Oak area. Also new tonight, what do you know? Education still pays. A new UTSA Urban Education Institute study says that the higher edu your education, the higher your paycheck. But those in science, technology, engineering, and math careers are going to earn more than those with formal degrees in other fields. So if you have kids, we know exactly what you're thinking right now. How do you get them started in STEM careers young? Well, the night team's Patty Santos has that story tonight. So we have to have a better connection. So how can we move this one? It's all constructive play and it's purposeful play. Jocelyn Bedeker, STEM educator at Calliston Elementary School, is challenging first graders to engineer, share ideas, and deal with failures. They're constantly being let down by when they drop their marble, does it end up where they want it? And how do they fix it? It's part of the school district's efforts to get children to engage in STEM learning in the early years. Their future is all in the lines of science, technology, engineering, and math. Parents can have a hand in shaping those skills too. And it's more than just playing with them. It's also about helping them think about solutions and solving their own problems. Instead of using your device as a, a babysitter for, you know, to say whatever, but really just have it be more geared towards apps that are educational, that are coding, things that are gearing them for the future. And here's why it matters. A new study by UTSA Urban Education Institute shows those with a STEM degree or just a STEM field certificate can earn more money than people with formal degrees in other fields. Students who want to become artists, fabulous. Go get your, your bachelor's degree or master's in arts. Um, but let's make sure we build in some other kind of uh, skills that are marketable. The study suggests education pays. A higher degree increases earning potential, but what you study matters too. Specifically, legal studies, business, construction science, these fields pay exceedingly well. Villarreal says it should guide families and educators on where their focus should be. These are really big decisions that have long-term life-shaping implications. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. You know, parents right now are Googling any STEM, <laughs> <laughs> STEM activities for their kids right now. I get it. I get it. All right, a live look outside right now. This is at Yanaguana Garden and Hemisphere. Lovely night tonight, 57 degrees. Not too bad out there. Yeah, that's a great place for the kids to go. Mm -hmm. They have the... They have the Fountains that come out of the ground. They have all kinds of cool things out there, but it's going to be a few months before that's going to come back into play, Adam. Hey, I think so. <laughs> before people are really out there a lot. And it's good for adults too, Steve, that blue thingy that where you run up and down, kind of that bouncy trampoline. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> Is it made for adults? It holds us just fine. I just was curious. <laughs> what are you trying I didn't to tell know. Me I, was, here, I just Steve? was asking a question. <laughs> <laughs> it's made for adults to play with their kids when they go there. Ah, okay, anyway, okay, let's that. chat about what's coming down the pike here. Near 70 degrees the next couple of days. So Tuesday and Wednesday mild, much colder Thursday and Friday. We could actually have up to 20 hours straight of below freezing temperatures. Compare that to last February when it was 107 hours. So this is very different. Yes, you're going to feel this cold snap for sure, but it's nothing 
to the extreme of what we had last February. So let's get to temperatures. Let's take a look at the cold air, where it's coming from, when it's going to get here and what it means even for precipitation. Right now, Rock Springs 48, but Del Rio at 60, 57 here in San Antonio, Pleasanton 58 degrees. By the way, we had a high temperature of 60 earlier today. That's the best we could do 60 degrees with 12 hundredths of an inch of rain at the airport across the state. Mostly we're in the 50s Alpine right now at 48 is one a cooler exception and there's some colder air off to the north, but relative to this time of year, it's really not that cold across the northern tier of the United States. The core of the cold air that's headed our way, it's still bottled up in Canada with the ratings down in the 20s below zero. And earlier today, we actually had a rating of 40 degrees below zero. I believe that was here at the Dawson Airport, not far from the Alaskan border there. So this cold air, it's already starting to plunge southward and it's not gonna make it here tomorrow. We're in the warm air tomorrow. We're in the mild air again on Wednesday. Wednesday night around nine o'clock, that's when the cold front hits and it's going to be one of the fronts that when it hits, oh, you know it, you'll hear the wind picking up outside and if you step out, you'll feel that cold air and the gusty breeze. So Thursday and Friday temperatures are going to take a hit. These are the morning temperatures that we're expecting Thursday morning 37, but by the afternoon, even cooler than that Friday morning, a hard freeze at 23 Saturday morning, a hard freeze at 25. So those are the mornings that you really have to pay attention to. And if you have one of the older homes or exposed piping, you'll want to take the necessary precautions. And of course, the pets, the plants and neighbors check on folks as well. But here's a look at the overall pattern in terms of precipitation over the past 12 hours. We had some good rainfall. It was just mainly east of San Antonio. We had a little bit around town and up in Kendall County better than nothing. Upper level disturbance that's moving on out of here. But as that cold front moves in Wednesday, we're expecting another round of rain tomorrow. Just some morning fog, afternoon sunshine. We get into Wednesday, low gray clouds and some scattered showers developing into the afternoon and evening, maybe even a brief non severe thunderstorm. Then as we get into Wednesday night, Thursday morning, intermittent areas of cold rain with the possibility of that wintry mix, particularly in the hill country. I think the most likely spot for that mix of freezing rain and sleet would be in the hill country Thursday morning on into the midday. Overall accumulations look pretty light on the tail end of this or on midday Thursday. We could have a brief light mix in San Antonio, but as for actual impacts, minor category here in the hill country, you know, farther north you go into Texas Thursday. That's where the impacts will be more significant. So plan for windy and cold Thursday, Friday below freezing for up to about 20 hours straight, a cold rain for the most part on Thursday with the light mix in the hill country with a minimal impact. As for tomorrow, 52 in the morning by the afternoon, we're sunny and lower 70s. How about that? Still near 70 on Wednesday, and then those afternoon readings are mostly in the 30s Thursday and Friday. But by the weekend, we're back in the 40s and 50s. Yeah, there's going to be a stretch there, though, where it is going to be cold. Old. Couple of mornings, really chilly. Yeah, thanks, Adam. All right. All right, so the Spurs, mm -hmm. they're home tomorrow. Yes. Can they beat the best in the West? Well, one of the best in the West when it comes to Golden State, because I guess you could actually turn that because Phoenix is actually the best in the NBA, but Golden State is playing tonight in Houston, so it'd be the second game of a back-to-back, -back. and it looks like the Spurs are going to be at full strength tomorrow to start this homestand, so we'll get you ready for that before that rodeo road trip, and a former Justin Rocket is headed to the Super Bowl. Coming up. Our shorthanded Spurs have returned home to start their final homestand before their A-game rodeo road trip that will feature three games in four nights starting tomorrow night with the new and improved Golden State Warriors. That's after they fell to the best team in the NBA, the Suns, last night in Phoenix. They were in that game until the fourth quarter. In fact, the Spurs enjoyed their largest lead of the game in the fourth, 91-79, thanks in large part to Doug McDermott's 24 points. They included six three-pointers. It was amazing that the Spurs are still in this game with DeJounte Murray out with a left knee contusion. Yaka Perto sideline was sore back and Derek White just out for rest. In fact, the Spurs were up by two points with just over two minutes to play when Trey Jones is just his third start this season is able to find Lonnie Walker at the fourth. That's until a controversial call where the officials felt Chris Paul had called a timeout before Devin Booker turned the ball over on a double dribble. That was a turning point in the game as Booker hit back-to-back -back three pointers to lift the Suns to 115-110 victory, extending their win streak to 10, sending their head coach Monty Williams to the NBA All-Star game as a coach of Team LeBron. That's where he will more than likely meet up with Chris Paul, who's expected to be named an All-Star for the 12th time after nearly getting a triple-double 
against the Spurs by falling two rebounds short. What was it like for Trey, who's just in his second season in the NBA, go up against a veteran like Paul? Well, the most respect for him um, as a basketball player, for sure. Um, you know, I've been watching him almost my whole life now. Um, the way he manipulates the game and um, leads his team and gets everyone involved, but then picks the spots uh, for himself and especially down the stretch, um, just making winning plays. Um, you know, I have so much respect for him. Um, you know, I love love battling with him and going going at him uh, for sure. And you know, I won't won't ever take that for granted. All right, Warriors in action tonight before facing the Spurs tomorrow, taking on the Rockets in Houston. This one's surprisingly close late in the fourth quarter, but Steph Curry was just too good tonight. He scored a game high 40 points on 13 to 23 shooting. 20 of those, 21 of those points came in the fourth quarter. Golden State wins it 122 to 108. They're now 38 and 13. Here's a matchup for tomorrow night, 7:30 tip time. And as I said earlier, looks like the Spurs are going to be back together again, all healthy. Pro Football Government, powered by Davis Law. Firm. One of the feel-good stories about Super Bowl 56 in just a little under two weeks has been the success enjoyed by veteran quarterback Matt Stafford. He was 0 for 3 in the postseason in 12 years with the Detroit Lions. Now in just one season with the Rams, he's 3-0 and and playing some of his best football of his career, throwing six touchdown passes, two rushing scores, and just one interception that included two game-winning drives in the last two weeks, including the Rams' 20-17 victory over the San Francisco 49ers. Now he's on the doorstep of his first-ever Super Bowl championship after 13 years in the league. I spent a lot of years in this league and, and I've loved every minute of it. I, um, you know, I feel blessed to be able to play in this league for as long as I have, um, but I sure am happy for this opportunity for not only myself, but really so many guys in that locker room that deserve this too. So then um, that's what it is. It's an opportunity, you know, to go out there and win another one. Congratulations to cornerback Trey Flowers, a Judson High School graduate, is headed to the Super Bowl with the Cincinnati Bengals. The 26-year-old graduated from Judson High School in 2013, is in his fourth year of the NFL, his first with the Bengals, who are making just their third trip to the Super Bowl in team history, still looking for that first win. And Trey is well aware of all the folks congratulating him and wishing him good luck at the Super Bowl one week from this coming Sunday in Los Angeles against the Rams. That's after the Bengals' 18-point comeback against the Kansas City Chiefs. Here's what he tweeted out. It's love. There's no way I can answer all of these messages. Now, when it comes to the star quarterback of the Cincinnati Bengals, a little different Super Bowl story. Joe Burrow is headed to the biggest game of his career after just his second season in pro football. It's hard to believe that the Bengals were just 2-14 and 14 the same year Burrow was winning the national championship for LSU. Even as a rookie, a knee injury 10 games into his first season, it looked like the Bengals were snake bit again. But the Bengals bounced back this year, finishing the regular season 10-7, and seven, but shocking the row of playoff wins over the Raiders, knocking out the number one seed in Tennessee, and finally eliminating favored Kansas City 27-24 in overtime. I think if you would have told me before the season that we'd be going to the Super Bowl, I probably would have called you crazy, but then, you know, we played a whole season and, you know, nothing surprises me now. I know the kind of guys that we have and the team that we have, so, you know, there's, there's still one left. We're excited about this one, but, you know, we'll celebrate tonight and then move on. All right, what cowboy turned down the Pro Bowl next? Pro Football Government, powered by Davis Law Firm. Cowboys quarterback Dak Prescott has turned down a chance to play in the Pro Bowl. That's after both Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers pulled out of the event. Uh, instead, Seattle's Russell Wilson and Minnesota's Kurt Cousins will step in. According to reports, Prescott is choosing rest after getting through the 2021 season, mostly healthy after a season-ending injury last year, the year before that, I should say, in week five. You got to give it to him because remember, he didn't even know if he was going to be able to play football again. It took nine months for him to get back on the field with the 2021 season and now went through a calf injury as well yeah. this past season. So yeah, I think that's a wise move. Rest. I have to think he had some nagging injuries. Let's still, have it all on. settle down for next season yeah. after that dismal playoff performance. Mm. <laughs> you said it, Greg. I did. Yeah. We'll be right back after this. A lot going on here in the seven day forecast is near 70 Tuesday and Wednesday. Some scattered rain, maybe a brief thunderstorm, not a strong one. Late Wednesday, Wednesday night and a cold rain most of Thursday, at least the first half of the day with a light mix, most likely just in the hill country. We could see a brief mix northern parts of Bear County briefly Thursday afternoon, but cold and windy. That's the headline. Thank All you, right, Adam. Thank you. GMSA at 430. Have a wonderful night.